Hello, and welcome back to the Compass Podcast. Today, we're joined by Mark Rosano, CEO of C6 Capital Holdings. Mark is an expert on all things capital markets, and we talk with him about how energy prices are changing because of inflation. Mark, thanks so much for joining us on the Compass Podcast. I'm really excited for today's discussion, even though it's not anyone's favorite topic to talk about prices rising, but is really important. And we need to see uh, where things are going, what the expectations are for prices, especially for uh, operationally expenditure, like uh, operationally expensive uh, mm-hmm. Bitcoin miners who are just pulling so much energy. No, it's a pleasure to be on. Thanks for thanks for having me. And it, it was funny when I was doing some of the uh, due diligence before we came on. Uh, MISO prices, which are just the Midwest prices, which is where we think you know some of the opportunities lie for uh, for Bitcoin mining. They're just going through the roof again, and it's a matter of you know how are they priced, where are they going, and I think that there's definitely a lot to talk about when we start looking at electricity prices and you know where can they go from here. Definitely, and there's there's a lot of ways to take this conversation, but we'll start off with your background, uh, both in energy markets, finance markets, and then. On my understanding is they're also moving quickly into the Bitcoin mining space, helping some firms find energy sources all across the United States. Sure. So I'll, I'll try to keep it brief. I, I, I tend to, uh, to rant, so I apologize in advance. I, I have kind of a weird background on how it went. Uh, so I started at Morgan Stanley Investment Management there. I was, uh, my, my background was FX rates, commodities. So I did everything from forwards, futures, options, uh, equities. We did some structured products when I was there. So it was great. I loved it. You know, we did everything that uh, I really wanted to do, especially on the commodity front, you know, in terms of owning physical, owning paper, you know, structuring different things around that. I went to go get my MBA. Uh, While I was there, I ended up living in the Middle East for a time, working in Mazdor City. Uh, There, we were kind of coming up with the balance between short cycle gas turbines, which got me into a lot of natural gas and LNG, obviously also natural gas, but just, just shipped a little bit differently. And then at the same time, uh, short cycle gas turbines mixed with those solar panels, uh, solar in general, wind and geothermal to kind of kind of marry what is the best mix and and one that doesn't have any interruption. Uh, so did that. Uh, then I left and I uh, ran a portfolio, uh, what what we called or what I named well to wheel. So that was following the hydrocarbon from the wellhead to the end user. I got very annoyed that I, everybody was very siloed, and I was like, well. It's all the same product, so why why don't we just kind of flatten the whole thing and understand the process? So, I did a lot in downstream chemicals, pet chem, uh, pet chem in general, refining you know where things are going in terms of plastics and beyond, as well as obviously EMPs, oil field services, and the like. Uh, did that? Uh, made a call that OPEC was going to go into a price war. Then uh, that was just from context that I had. Went down the uh, the value chain and did a lot in fi- on the fixed income side, doing high yield, distressed debt, taking companies into and out of bankruptcy, you know, restructuring loans, all those uh, fun things. Started my own hedge fund, uh, something very similar uh, than my my now middle daughter. She's fine uh, now, but uh, she we found out that she was going to need massive heart surgery at the 36 week uh, sonogram. Uh, she ended up going to the hospital. You know, didn't uh, surgery didn't go well. Uh, they told us that she wasn't going to survive the weekend. And she did. She's now four. So yay. You know, she's uh, and she's the little monster out of, out of the three of them. Uh, then uh, during that point, I, I had to sh- I turned I shut down the, the hedge fund, uh, ended up working at Bloomberg. Uh, and then there I was doing commodity strategy, kind of marrying my geopolitical background uh, with with some of the things that I've, I did. And then obviously looking at commodities as an aggregate, because we did a lot in the past on uh, on ags and ferts. And then when I was looking to come out of Bloomberg, uh, I, I looked at the market. I was like, you know, I don't really like the way the public markets look. And I think there's a lot of opportunity on the private side. So in 2019, the thesis was that we were coming into an electricity shortage when you're looking at base load capacity and you look at the grid. So the view was that we were going to have a shortage of available or at least consistent and affordable electricity. So we wanted to find solutions for that. Uh, we were coming into a global uh, you know, food shortage that was only going to get worse. And, you know, here we are. And the focus was to try to invest in not only fertilizers, but also ways to increase yield. And then other energy infrastructure plays, one of them being uh, renewable diesel without using food, you know, for those that 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 saw the E15 comment, even though we're in a global food crisis, 
So those are the three pieces right now that we're that we're working on. Uh, you know, I, I have a big background in LNG, you know, FERC, all those pieces, and now on the Bitcoin side, we're working with some Bitcoin miners because on the base load capacity, which is where we're looking to purchase, uh, we're uh, buying hydroelectric dams. You know, there's 65 percent of the hydroelectric dams in the U.S. are actually owned by mom and pops. Uh, so, or small industries. So there's an opportunity to come in to pick up some of these things for a favorable price in some interesting areas that see a lot of price increases. And we're looking at ways to bring on some Bitcoin capacity because not only do you have the water uh, to help cool the plant, but you also have the power that is very consistent and is uh, is readily available. Yeah, I first became exposed to the idea of using like these small hydro dams across the United States last summer at uh, Bitcoin Mining Disrupt uh, or yeah, Bitcoin Mining Disrupt in Miami. And it's a pretty cool idea. Just like imagining having a, like a small, less than one megawatt site in your backyard that mm-hmm. has like a creek running around. You just turn a turbine and there you go. You have uh, you have some free energy, you can mine some Bitcoin with it. I'm, I'm curious from your background, what sort of strategies were you utilizing to understand the global mat- macro picture? Because there's a lot of people out there who just to be blunt, are, are LARPs and they're <laughs> just, they, they like my macro stuff and then they, you know, point at a chart and make a decision on prices. But uh, there's obviously so many different ways that you can strategize these things and then deploy capital behind it. And your firm has been successful. You said you worked with Bloomberg on this. So what are some of the things that you guys were looking at for your firm to be able to make these decisions and make you guys successful? Sure. So one, some of the big things, uh, I've always been more of a top-down uh, person. So the way I look is where is the, geo, where is the geopolitical structure? You know, are we coming into a, a generational cycle that is going to see more war? Are we going to see, you know, are we, are we at the tail end of something? So one of the things that I was concerned about coming into 2020 was that we were coming into a very uh, concerning uh, decade. You know, one of the things that I had written about was that it was going to be a weird amalgamation of the 30s and 70s between hyper and I don't want to call it hyperinflation, but let's just say a double digit inflationary pressures mixed with stagflation and then eventually a deflationary cycle. And within that, there was going to be a lot of unknowns, especially when you start layering in food and all these other pieces. So one of the things is that we look at the top down, you know, where where do we think there's opportunity? Where do we think there's the greatest risk? And then we we look to deploy capital accordingly. So one of the things that we've looked at is really food. Obviously, uh, if you take Maslow's hierarchy, you know you need that safety piece, and then you need food. You need food and water. And if if you don't have either one of those three things, you know that uh, <laughs> let's just say everything else becomes secondary, if not you know the last on the list. So those are ways that we wanted to look at it, and then start to structure that in terms of you know what are some of the friendly countries, what are what are countries that are seeing a a, a a resurgence like Vietnam is one that we've been uh, very uh, positive on. Uh, India is one that we were we were excited about. Now we're starting to to kind of go the other way, just in terms of some of the pressures on the inflation front, food front. And then when you start looking out, you know, the U.S., Canada are ones that we think is going to see a lot of uh, a lot of growth. And then there is some kind of sneaky opportunity within Eastern Europe. Obviously, Russia, Ukraine is front and center, but there's also a lot of opportunity when you start looking at uh, solutions and deploying them within the Eastern Bloc. You grab my mic there. Remember to use it. <laughs> uh, no, the the macro scene. Obviously, there's a lot of people who are just going to armchair it. So it's interesting to find somebody who actually knows what they're talking about, and that is what makes today's conversation really helpful. Is that you know inflation and energy prices pretty well. So let's dig right into that. When we're, we're looking at Bitcoin mining. They are Bitcoin miners are long energy, and they have to be. They they have to so much of it. Uh, your OPEX just is everything when you're calculating what you're going to mine during a given period. And if you're going to be profitable going to the multiple years that ASICs have uh, their, their lifespan. Currently, we're seeing inflation eke into every single part of society, whether it be gas prices or food prices or used cars, new cars. And it's also hitting uh, just wholesale energy prices as well that affect Bitcoin miners. So I'd like to kind of get a perspective from you on where you're seeing inflation hit the most right now. And if energy prices, uh, for the most part, are seeing that uh, just like a a larger disparity than other places inflation are hitting. We talked right before the show, natural gas basically has gone parabolic in terms of uh, price for, for natural gas. 
Uh, but there's obviously a lot of other energy sources out there that perhaps are not facing those price headwinds. Sure. So one of the things that, you know, my, my background is in uh, my degree was in, F, uh, you know, foreign exchange. And when you start looking at FX and rates, you know, they're, they're very much together. Sometimes they can kind of fall apart, but that provides some opportunity when they start to, to, uh, to deviate from their normal uh, spectrum. So when you start looking at the U.S. dollar, you know, what is the dollar doing? Is it getting stronger? Is it getting weaker? You know, what are rates doing? Are they going up? Are they going down? <clears throat> you know, one of the problems that we have right now is we've been in a bond bull market since the since the early 80s. So you're seeing this pretty much a steady decline since Volcker got in front of uh, rates, and then you started to see this come down. Now, after seeing these rates go to, to uh, you know, obviously, as we've seen, go negative, what comes next? And that's when you're starting to see the shakeup and you're starting to see the dollar, you know, become some of that strength. And the reason why that's so important is because the dollar stands for everything. When you start looking at the reserve currency of the world, how things are trading, where things are going from here. So when you start looking at rates, we're, in, we're now in a net rate rising cycle. And for most people who are watching this or are, you know, or, or that maybe have started to read about a rate rising cycle, most have never seen it. And now we're coming into one of the most aggressive after really one of the biggest experiments when you look at COVID, when everybody was easing and you had fiscal uh, policy getting easier, monetary policy getting easier. But also, all of these issues also gave rise to cryptocurrency because you start looking at fiat and you're like, all right, well, what is fiat actually backed by? Like, what what are we what are we really looking at going forward? But when you start looking at at uh, energy prices, the dollar is still going to be king. The, you know, the dollar is still going to really set the standard because a lot of the producing nations have their currencies pegged to the dollar, and they will always want to transact, or at least for for the most part, transact in dollars. So when you start looking at at where oil prices are, where those flows are, there's that there's that that back and forth between where is supply and where is demand. And right now there's so much geopolitical uncertainty, you're seeing a lot of this volatility, but realistically, let's just say we're between 95 and 115 and that's where we're going to be as we all Putin's going to try to go give Ukraine a hug, then Ukraine is going to say no, and you're going to see these, you know, like right now we're down $5.50 just because, you know, why not? And that's that's the uncertainty that's going to keep in there, that's going to stay in there. And that that also has that effect on natural gas. Like, where is natural gas going? What are some of the, the pressure points? And as you, you were talking about things that we were discussing earlier, you know, natural gas has a lot of uh, upward momentum in terms of where are, is LNG, where is local consumption. So natural gas consumption within the U.S. has been increasing. It's going to continue to increase. You know, it's some, some little sneaky thing that the uh, current administration has done. It's no longer a bridge fuel. If you notice, they've actually deleted that term. Now it's just a fuel. You know, one of the things that we've always thought was that uh, natural gas was going to be a fuel of the future. It was going to be one of the key pieces of the basket. But when you start looking at, at, uh, at Germany and you start looking at Europe in general, they're so reliant on Russian gas. And we've seen it continue to come through. It's still 90 or so MCM a day. So there's still some continuous move, which... If you think about that, you know, <laughs> through the math, it's like so Germany and Europe pays Russia and then Russia pays Ukraine for the transmitting of gas. And it's like uh, so Europe is financing Russia's war and then Russia is financing Ukraine's war against Russia. It's like, got it. That's the world we live in today. So when you look at that, that pressure, when you look at that, it, it, it's not just on the demand side of natural gas, but how do we respond on the supply side? And then like when you were asking about the inflation, where are we seeing inflation? Steel prices, labor prices, um, you know, prop in, when you start looking at sand or the lack of sand or availability, all of these things have this knock-on effect and everybody has to get their margin. You know, where am I going to make my money going forward? And that's when you start looking at diesel, you know, still over $5, that goes into it. So all of these things culminate with, I have higher demand and I can't really have a supply response so here's where we're, we have this kind of this this exponential move in pricing at this point. Yeah, it's pretty fascinating to see <clears throat> the the confluence of both mass money printing over the last two three years, really since quantitative easing uh, out of the financial crisis, and the huge spikes in demand post COVID hitting at the same time. And to me, that seems like a really nice scapegoat for a lot of the politicians who are. Uh, dealing with inflation right now, they can just blame this all on the demand side when it 
really has a lot of aspects involved with it. Uh, much of that has to do with the money printing. Returning to the energy market itself, though, I'm curious about how much the international demand for energy, whether it be like natural gas or other goods like uh, oil itself, plays into the domestic United States market. Because we've seen natural gas prices in the United States go up. But is that really caused by the war in Ukraine when, when we have almost two separate markets? Or do these markets play with each other enough that they're going to induce uh, prices to go up on both sides? So th- because we've been building out LNG capacity, you know, going back to when Chenier was initially going to import uh, LNG for those that are old enough to remember that, then all of a sudden the shale revolution began and that was when we actually flipped and we were going to export. So since that period, you we, we've come to a point where <clears throat> almost 12 million tons per annum can now get exported. So when you look at what has been done within the US, you've had a big conversion or, you know, for the most part from heating oil, diesel into natural gas consumption. You've seen that pivot and on the industrial side as well, trying to consume as much natural gas as possible, methane, cleaner burning, you know, not using diesel and heating oil. So internally we've seen that increase and that's going to continue. But then at the same time, you're starting to see that really uh, become a much bigger factor. Obviously it was in Europe. And then when you look at the emerging markets, especially Asia, because the easiest, lowest hanging fruit is converting coal to natural gas. So when you start looking at those connect the connectivity, and I was just pulling up some of the, the data that we have, like when you look at just taking March for an example, you know, March we exported 7.4 million tons. I mean, so you're talking about a serious number that is going off the coast. And when you start looking at that that pivot, Europe is the consuming factor because Europe has made an agreement with JERA, which is the uh, the entity out of Japan that tries to buy LNG as an aggregate, trying to get the best price. They have have been reselling some of their capacity back into uh, Europe because Europe is trying to use the shoulder season, which, and for those that don't know, shoulder season is the low period. Then obviously, so the low periods for, for natural gas consumption is, as you would think, fall and spring. You know, you're not really using air conditioning. You're not really using heating. But because Europe's appetite has been so aggressive, they, we've essentially taken away the shoulder season. Now, one of the other things that that is little known is Russia also exports LNG into Europe from Yamal, from other areas. So when you start looking at that pivot, you have that natural gas consumption. So the U.S. has seen the increase, even though we're at a record amount of supply, that international market really starts to take a, a certain pivot, especially when you compare Henry Hub to TTF to um, to JKM. When you start looking at the different natural gas prices, you know we're still the cheapest, even at seven dollars. Which, if you think about that, that is fascinating. That we're still the cheapest. But then when you take the knock-on effect, there's also the liquids component, and there's propane and LPG consumption, uh, which is liquefied petroleum gas, which is a mixture of propane and butane, has also been increasing. So. Propane is actually much easier to transport versus LNG because I don't have to, you know, cryogenically freeze propane to move it from point A to point B. I can put it on the road a bit easier. The conversion from from diesel to propane is easier. So when you start looking at the liquids front, you know, we're exporting LPG and ethane on the other side. When you think about the NGL basket or natural gas liquids of ethane, propane, butane, we're exporting that at a at a at a, just a rising rate. You know, Saudi Arabia is taking advantage of that. You know, they've raised LPG prices to 2014 highs, which even at a dollar forty in the U.S., I mean, we're still the cheapest. So when you start looking at all of these products that were typically kind of beholden to the U.S., now all of a sudden you have, as as you pointed out, you know, where those markets start to actually converge, and there is that demand, which is obviously keeping prices elevated in the U.S while also uh, being competitive into the global market. So I'm curious for Bitcoin mining, moving back to purchase power agreements and how these play into the entire consideration. So when, when a Bitcoin miner, just for context for the audience uh, who may not know, uh, when a Bitcoin miner goes to a facility, they oftentimes have to sign a purchase power agreement for a certain amount of energy to be used over a certain period of time. And they're more or less locked into a rate, whether that be like, Five cents a kilowatt hour, or or something like that, and they also have to uh, use like a certain threshold. So if this facility has five megawatts and they sign on for three megawatts, they're expected to use that three megawatts. And 
uh, they're, they're liable for that and they have to figure out what to do with it. Hopefully plug in all those machines and get them hashing. Those PPAs, legal contract, uh, you're signed into that price, but oftentimes there's flexibility in these things. Uh, I know of a, a Bitcoin mine in Colorado that had a force mayor clause come out recently and basically all of them got kicked out because uh, the person wanted their energy back and it was just how it is. It's part of the PPA. Like Those things exist in the legal world. I'm wondering now that we're seeing inflation creep into energy markets, are Bitcoin miners expected to see their PPAs go up across the board? Or would you expect that to be more of a localized thing where uh, this community is being hit by higher energy prices or this person is taking advantage of the excuse of inflation to increase a PPA? Uh, Or is this more tied up in the legal contracts and you can't really touch it and it just is what it is? So there's a lot of ways that you can kind of protect yourself from the person such as myself selling electricity and then the miner on the other side who's buying it is you want to be very clear when you have the purchase plan agreement, because typically, you know, especially as you were talking about the life expectancy of the miner, you know, some, depending on the refurbishing cycle, you know, figure three to five years is what you're going to look at. And then you go into, you know, then you can obviously start to expand out, but typically you have three years and the one of the things that we've been seeing is three years with the additional two years as being the option. So when you're looking at the three year side, you want to be very clear. And if especially if you don't want a force majeure, uh, force majeure situation is, look, I will I and this is what we've been doing is like, I'll, I'll lock in at four kilo, uh, four cents. So I'm going to lock in at four cents, but I will provide a certain percentage of my revenue that will also come to you, whether that's, you know, 5%, whether that's 10%, you know, typically we try to stay between five and 10% so that everybody's, uh, you know, benefiting from the, where prices are at the moment. You know, then at the other side, you can say, well, I'll also pay rent. And then the, the facility, one of the things that we're opening is like, you'll share the cost of labor. You're like, there's no point in you having your team, me having my team, let's share the, let's share the price and we'll have people that are trained in both. But you want to have an escalator and you want to be very clear on what that escalator is. It's like, look, I don't want to get turned off. So if prices go to X, you can increase my rate by a penny or half a penny. You know, if if rates go to Y, then I'm going to say, all right, well, at that point, that's going to be the cap. And you have to be able to be very clear on where my cap is. And typically, when you're seeing this, you're also getting the benefit of getting some of that revenue from Bitcoin mining. So you still want them as you said, to be hashing, to be to be generating this income. Now, given prices have come under pressure, but they've been fairly fixed in a very tight band. So when you start factoring in, you're paying me rent, you're sharing the cost of my of my labor. I'm getting you know five percent of revenue plus you're you're paying me four and a half cents. All of a sudden, all of that together becomes a very viable option, and you want to be very clear on that because you don't want to have that turn off now. Some of the ones that we've looked at and that we've created, depending on the volatility of the market and what the what the uh, Bitcoin miner wanted, they said, "Look, if rates go uh, to you know have this parabolic move, let's just use Germany for an example, you can turn me off because I don't want to be producing in that. I can't afford it. And at that point, you can then sell a hundred percent to the grid, and then as things come back down, you know there'll be uh, a certain amount of optionality. There's also one." That has a calculation in it where if you know if if let's just say German prices happen in the U.S., we see three hundred dollars, uh, three hundred euro megawatt hour. But Bitcoin goes from let's say thirty five thousand to one hundred fifty thousand. Well, even though electricity prices went up, I'm still making more money by sharing in revenue with you. So that you can be very clear on what that number is where you're going to pivot from the grid to the miner and back. So I, I think that's. You want to, and this is, I, I know legal is a call center and it's frustrating at times, but that's where you want to spend the most money and understanding and having it being very clear what those rates are going to be. And then on the two year, uh, on the two year extension, you pre negotiate, you know, what it will that be? You will have a 5% increase in, in kilowatt hours, uh, you know, in, uh, in, in price, but we'll, de- we'll decrease rent by, you know, 10%, because at this point, you know, you've, you paid the money to, to have the step down, to have the, uh, uh, the cement slab. So again, these are things that you want to be create more plug and play. And it's just a very consistent revenue for the, uh, the, the producer of electricity. 
So the takeaway is get a good lawyer and, and pay them well. <laughs> and get a contract like this. Exactly. I mean, that, that's really where you want to make sure that there's no ambiguity because that is where you're going to get the, that's where you can say, it's like, oh, no, no, well, it, since it's not set, it's not there, I, I can clearly declare force majeure and, and you're, uh, you know, you're out of luck. And there are some, there are some guys that say, you know, because we're dealing with hydropower and given we're, we're dealing with uh, areas that could see some level of, of declines. Some people have said, look, I also want to be tapped into the grid just because I want to make sure I'm producing 365 days a year, 24 seven. And again, some, sometimes that isn't an option. Some are okay with downtime. It all, it all comes down to what the miner wants. Okay, moving away from the particularities of this conversation, maybe spreading out a little bit, putting on some tinfoil hats for a second as well. There's a, a nice tweet, not I really not a nice tweet, from Digiconomist, uh, who is a Bitcoin skeptic, to put it lightly. And he and I were going back and forth the other day about energy costs and what the impact of inflation in Bitcoin mining will be on energy costs and what governments will do to tamper energy costs going forward. Uh, essentially, like, will Bitcoin miners become a scapegoat for increased costs of energy across the board? And uh, we are going back and forth on it a little bit. His models are always like 10 to 100x larger than they should be. And I think it's just because you know, he, he likes to do that. He works for a central bank. Uh, but it is an interesting question that I've gotten from a few people going forward if energy prices continue to inflate because of monetary inflation and because of just demand for energy sources. Are Bitcoin miners going to be in a tough spot? Uh, I'd like to get your take on this. Uh, Also, maybe we could sprinkle in a little uh, info on what you expect energy prices to do going into this next year. Sure. So to kind of go after the the Bitcoin mining side, I I think that's when you have to appreciate hash rate, you know, because when prices go up, typically hash rates fall. So then the miners that are able to stay in business are going to to capture that because you're going to have less mining which then means that prices should go higher because you're going to be generating less coins, which then means that those, so you're all, you're almost kind of guaranteed to see some of that appreciation when you're looking at just the sheer mechanics of supply coming down. I mean, just look at what happened when you had China shutting everyone off. All of a sudden there was this massive pivot of where can I go? And you had Bitcoin uh, prices you know, re- respond to that as you had the supply coming off in terms of new coins. So when you start looking at the different uh, economics of it, we do see prices going higher. I mean, some of the things that we're looking to do on the private equity side is buying up some of these dams. You know, when you start looking at the three dams that we purchased in in New England, you know, we were expecting to see prices of about nine cents. You know, that was what we were modeling. Uh, that was in 2020. We wanted to take a recession year. Right now, they've been throwing off anywhere between 22 to 26 cents on a net level. Now, from a Bitcoin mining perspective, I would never recommend somebody to be in, in large parts of New England. There's some spots within Vermont, New Hampshire that have some optionality, but it's really the Midwest. And, and the question to where are prices going and how is inflation going to do that, you have to look at what is the price setter. You know, so in, in New England, because they have essentially a, a cement wall that is keeping any new pipelines from being built from Pennsylvania into uh, into that region, you know, by Pennsylvania, I'm talking about the Marcellus. So they have to import natural gas. So when you start looking at the LNG market, and to be clear, they have to import it from abroad because the Jones Act prohibits anybody from from exporting from Houston up into Boston because there is no Jones Act flag vessel. The Jones Act vessel just has to be made in the U, built in the U.S., manned by U.S. Uh, sailors in order to be Jones Act, uh, you know, uh, approved, if you will. So that means that you know, Boston is is beholden to pulling down from from Europe. So when you look at New England, their price setter is natural gas. And then when you turn to the Midwest, which I think has some of the most opportunity for Bitcoin mining, is coal. Coal is really kind of that bellwether. Now the issue is you're seeing more and more coal facilities get you know, slated for retirement, which is becoming an underlying problem because you're. But at the same time, you're taking down base load. But coal prices have inher- have essentially gone up because when you look at where things are saying where where things are going for the last twenty five years, you know you've told these coal companies and these employees that they're never going to have a job again. So go out and trying to start a new mine is near impossible because who's going to want to go work in a coal mine? So now you have 
that uh, to your point on demand supply, the supply response isn't there, but demand continues to go up, especially for, on the thermal front. So now you have this, this weird conundrum in terms of where things are going, and that's when you look to the Midwest. So there's some, some uh, interesting opportunities where you take that coal facility, you can put some carbon capture on it, you can actually create uh, a lot of uh, side products because we're looking at that, that coal facility as an opportunity. You know, there's an opportunity to make it green. There's an opportunity to actually throw off other, uh, you know, uh, different industrial gases and also having, you know, wind and solar next to it and, and having some of that opportunity and in creating a, essentially this power generating because we need base load capacity and base load capacity is something that is running 24 seven, which basically is nuke coal. And as long as the natural gas facility is built right, natural gas. So those are your three pieces, because if the sun's not shining, if the wind's not blowing and you don't have enough battery capacity, which is very difficult, you have to have a short cycle gas turbine. And as we saw in Texas and ERCOT, there are times when short cycle gas turbines can't turn on. And that's when you start to get these big, um, this big backdrop. But from the mining side, you know, we see some of that opportunity in the stranded gas that you're seeing in Texas, that you're seeing in parts of Oklahoma where it makes sense because I can't get it to market, so it's just gonna sit there. So let's bring in some of this Bitcoin mining. The other problems are of, and, and I think some of the Bitcoin miners are finding out the, the hard way, it's a bit warm in Texas, it gets a little hot, and uh, the cooling costs start to add up, which is why if you go further north, you have a certain amount of opportunity, and then when you're looking at the dams, you, know, you can pull water off of it. So again, there's, uh, there's a lot of these opportunities, but I think this, this pivot is going to really move where Bitcoin miners are, but also take some of this hash rate off, which I, should, I think should also support pricing at this point. Yeah, hash rate going down might help uh, some people's projections a little bit this year because there's definitely a lot of hash rate supposed to go online, mm -hmm. at least from uh, manufacturer orders. So we only have about 10 minutes left, and I want to talk about uh, where we're going next expectations for the next year, like stagflation and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But before that, I want to get a quick word in about demand and the uh, basically the demand for energy. Like, Can all these energy producers in the United States get online quick enough to meet the demand uh, that people are expecting? Now, obviously, we had that headline the other day from the Biden administration that was putting out more oil reserves. And that did basically nothing for the market. And most people in the oil and gas markets were like, Okay, you're releasing these reserves. This is only a temporary measure. It's not going to help anything out. Gas prices, from my understanding, didn't really respond to it. So are energy providers available or able to meet demand right now? Or are we looking two, three years away to be able to meet the current demand we need now? The, the issue right right here is it, it's it's very difficult because when you look at... So one of the shows that, that we have on the, uh, on the Primary Vision Network on YouTube is the frack spread count because you, you need, you know, everyone likes to talk about rigs and don't get me wrong, rigs are important, you have to poke holes, but the frack spread actually turns it into production. That's when you're going in, you're fracking, you're opening up the well and you're tying it in. The problem is the amount of horsepower available has diminished. And I'm sure I'm not, I'm not uh, lying to anyone or, or surprising anyone by saying that our supply chain is in trouble. So when you think about the steel, when you think about the transmissions, the fluid ends, the trucks, all of those things are struggling right now. And because of 2020, if you had, a, uh, you know, let's just say you had 100 horsepower, 1,000 horsepower in the yard, you needed a new fluid end, you went to go to the yard to take it. You know, you started to see a lot of this, you know, essentially piecing, uh, picking apart the, the available horsepower or what used to be available. So now you have the problem of, where's my availability company? And if I want it, can I get it? And the answer is no. And then you start looking at pipe. Can I get pipe? And the, the, uh, the pipe guys are like, look, if you get in the queue, you know, I'm not going to thread it because, uh, because pipes have to be threaded going into the, into the oil patch. Once the pipe comes in, I'll then thread it for you. So it's three months waiting for, for pipe. Then it's another six weeks to, to wait for it to get threaded. Next thing you know, it's four and a half months later, and I'm finally getting my pipe showing up. So you have these these built-in bottlenecks. Then when you look at some of the uh, the capacity, where you know people have talked about Biden saying, "Oh, well, look at what he did on on the uh, on permits." It's like, okay, well, if you permit me and allow me to drill it, but then you hinder my ability to build the new tiebacks or little pipelines to the pipe, 
it, it's still useless. I'm, I'm not going to truck this. So I'm just going to let it sit folly and just let it sit in general. So when you look at the backlog, it, it's really in order to see that demand response, <clears throat> it's really that 18 to two years out because uh, to 18 months to two years out, because you're not going to see that response. Now, the other problem is obviously the supply side, you know, typical uh, economics, supply uh, is short, prices go up, demand comes down. And when you look at what is happening internationally, you have emerging markets that are still providing subsidies for petrol and for food. At my opinion, they're going to have to choose and they'll choose food over fuel. And you're starting to see that come back and forth. And as you see that balance, that's where you see that pressure come down because people have to make decisions. You know, one of the things that you had asked that I, I failed to, uh, to, to address was inflation. You know, where is inflation going? And that's only going to keep things worse because when you look at pricing, and this is, again, going outside of just oil, when you look at commodities in general, that zinc, aluminum, copper, all of these things are, have, are, are below 1997 storage levels. So you're looking at an inherent shortfall. And yes, Russia is a gigantic producer. Russia has to dump oil into the market. They, they have no choice. They have to sell at any price possible because they can't risk shutting in because they don't know if they can bring it back on. But it's not just oil they produce. It's you know the alumina that they import to export aluminum. It's the zinc. It's the, um, it's the iron ore that they send into Germany. There's so many different knock-on effects, and that's creating that, that supply shortage. So you still need to see that demand come down. But even as demand comes down, you're just starting to get into balance and you're not able to build that amount of supply, keeping things very tight. And that leads us into this inflationary pressure giving way to stagflation. Because even as demand's coming down, you should expect to see builds coming in, things, and you're just not going to get that. And that's where you get the stickiness prior to, I think, a, a much bigger deflationary cycle. Yeah, the CPI numbers uh, were really interesting last week. 8.5% highest in 40 years. And there were some interesting notes within that as well. Uh, the one that stuck out to me the most was the used car market. It's down like 3% in prices, but mm -hmm. year over year is still up like at 35% or, or something uh, quite high. That is just demand destruction as I understand it. People are not willing to pay prices for a used car that high. And so they won't pay for it. And so the owner of the car is now discounting the price uh, prior to what it was beforehand. And so that's, in a sense, lowering inflation. Some might, might disagree, but at least the prices are decreasing a little bit. But what you're saying here with stagflation is that prices would stay elevated, most likely, in the, in the, into the long term, but like not as much... Um, how should I rephrase this? Like Prices will, will stay elevated for the most part, and they might discount a little bit, like we saw in the used car market. Right. But for the most part, they're going to stay fairly elevated compared to 2020 or 2015 or 20, 2010. And that's because as you see demand for used cars coming down, you should see more used cars showing up. But because of the shortage of microchips, like if you 1500 chips are in a car, you know, where are you getting the microchips? So you, if everyone, you know, some little things like tin, tin goes into the soldering. Where are you getting tin? Myanmar. Myanmar has been in a civil war for, for how, uh, almost over a year now. I mean, you can go back to saying that they've been in the, at some sort of civil war since 2014. Then you look at neon. Russia is one of the largest exporters of neon. Neon is, is important for, for microchip production. So then you start looking at steel. Germany is one of the largest producers of cars. They, they have a steel shortage. So even though prices come down, it's just you're not seeing the supply coming through to really replenish that. And that's where you're starting to see the pressure. And then you take that into rates. You know, we have mortgage rates now over 5%. And if the cost of owning it goes up, like if you bought a car in 2020, as, as I was lucky enough to before a woman decided to attempt fate and cross traffic without looking, when you look at, when you look at that in 2020, I, I, I had a lease that was based off of like 0.25%. And, and it, yes, the prices were higher, but I was paying 25 basis points. Now I was lucky because I locked in a rate at 2.49%. And if you were to go do that right now, it's over 3%. You know, uh, the, the financial, uh, you know, just for, if I, I am a German snob. I love German cars. So the, I, the BMW that I was getting, I mean, BMW financial was over four and a quarter. So that also kind of brings the prices down because if the cost to me goes up, 
well, then prices have to balance. And that's always going to also decrease because it's like, all right, I, I can, you know, when BMW was charging me a quarter percent and I was paying $5.99 a month, now I'm paying over $1,100. Well, what's Honda charging? What is, what is Ford charging? And that's when you start to see that creep. And that's when you start looking at inflation on replacement costs. Because if you know inflation really starts to go parabolic when I I go down in in uh, in quality. So when you look at uh, big box stores, BJ's, Costco, Sam's Club, those memberships are are exploding because it's like, look, I can't afford Whole Foods. You know, I can maybe afford the local food store, but I, I'm going to have to buy in bulk. And once you buy in bulk, where are you going next? Outside of I have to cut. You know, it's like, I only buy name brand because I'm a name brand snob. It's like, well, the name brand is kind of expensive. I'm going to go generic. And then once the generic prices go up, it's like, well, wh where else Where else do I go now? And as you go down that scale, that's when you start to see that inflation come up. And once you can no longer finance your current living standards, even at generic prices, that's when you start to see that demand destruction. That's when you start to see things really tighten up of, I can't go out to eat this week. Uh, you know, I can't drive to Disney, Six Flags, what, what have you. I have to stay home because I just can't afford it. Yeah, I feel like I'm living out my macro 101 classes from college and <laughs> in real life, talking about like supplement goods and demand destruction and whatnot. Mark, I really want to thank you for coming on the Compass podcast and talking about energy prices and inflation. This has been a really helpful episode. I think a lot of our listeners and Bitcoin miners out there are going to find this useful. Well, I appreciate it. If you want me to have... Come back on and, and rant about where things oh, yeah. are. I'm happy to do so. <laughs>